Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And welcome to this Towards Stockholm Plus 50 uh, webinar, Connecting the Dots, Making a Forceful Connection, pardon me, Making a Forceful, forceful Canon of the Rio Conventions and the Multilateral Environmental Agreements. This event has been organized by Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future in collaboration with Forum Norway, the Civil Society Unit at the United Nations Environment Program in Nairobi, and with the support of the government of Sweden, the host country of Stockholm Plus 50. I'm Charles Newhan, Chairman of Stakeholder Forum for a Sustainable Future, and your host today from New York. I'm joined by today's moderator, John Scanlon, who has a long history of involvement with the United Nations and international organizations, including working at UNEP, uh, the International Union for Conservation of Nature, and as Secretary General of CITES, the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species of Wild Fauna and Flora. As you can see on your screen, we have a panel of special guests who, with a diverse range of experiences and knowledge, will be introduced by John in the coming minutes. For those of you unfamiliar with the Stakeholder Forum, it is an international not-for-profit NGO that has, for more than 25 years, been working to advance sustainable development at all levels. Stakeholder Forum seeks to provide a bridge between those who have a stake in sustainable development and the international forums where decisions are made in their name. Before I hand over the floor to John, there is a bit of housekeeping to attend to. The webinar is being recorded and a link to that recording, a copy of the presentations and the webinar chat will be posted on the Towards Stockholm Plus 50 website soon afterwards. Now a bit about how the audience will interact. As you will see, attendee cameras and microphones will be muted as we begin and they'll remain so throughout the webinar unless there's time for us to invite an attendee uh, invited by the moderator to speak. There might not be time for that, but should we find extra time, we might have that option. And should the attendee be invited to speak, we'll activate their microphone. There will be two opportunities for questions from attendees and those questions should be submitted to the Q&A window, not into the chat box. The chat window is for you to communicate with each other, where you can post links to matters relevant to the webinar topic and share contact details with each other if you wish to. You are welcome to, screw, to scroll through the questions and upvote them. That is, vote for a question that you too would like to be addressed. That will help us to decide and to choose uh, the questions that the panel can answer in the time that we have. Should the moderator invite an attendee to speak, we'll ask them to raise their hand. Apologies in advance for not being able to answer all questions due to time constraints, because we have quite a full uh, program for you today. So without further delay, let me please welcome John uh, and our panel of experts. John, I'll hand the floor over to you. Please activate your camera, John, thank you. Great, thank you very much, Charles, and uh, warm greetings to everyone who's joined us online uh, live today and also to those who are going to watch today's uh, webinar uh, via YouTube or any other means. Big thank you, Charles, to the Stakeholder Forum for organizing today's event, very much appreciated. And a particular thanks to all of our speakers whose names you can see uh, up on the screen right now, where we're very fortunate to have such a, a wonderful array of speakers with us this afternoon. Now, it's a very big year, uh, 2022, because it marks 50 years since the 1972 uh, Conference on the Human Environment, which was held in Stockholm, Sweden. Hence, we're talking about Stockholm plus 50. And we can look back uh, 50 years uh, to see what we've achieved. We can look to, to today to see what's uh, in progress. And we can look to the future to see what's needed and, and what we'd like to see happen uh, over the next 50 years. Um, over the last 50 years, I think it's fair to say that the world has turned to international environmental law to address some of its big environmental challenges. Uh, we've seen a proliferation of lawmaking, the development of multilateral environmental agreements, as we're talking about today, to protect and restore our environment, to look at how we sustainably utilize our natural resources and many other issues as well. And we're gonna be exploring that with our speakers. Uh, today, we are going to hear from well-renowned academics, um, staff of the UN family, uh, executive secretaries of uh, multilateral environmental agreements, leaders from civil society, 
and the private sector. So we really have a, a, a wonderful group of people joining us this afternoon. The only challenge we have is that we've got two hours set aside to uh, engage with a lot of speakers. So unfortunately, we won't be able to um, uh, speak to everyone as long as we'd like to. I think we could speak to every speaker for a full two hours, but we have around uh, 10 minutes each um, and Carolina will be offering some comments after the first session. Now, in session one, we're going to lead off with our good friend and colleague, uh, Professor Maria Ivanova. Maria is without doubt, I think, the world's leading scholar on um, uh, UNEP, the UN Environmental Pro Environment Program. Uh, Maria has interviewed, I think, all of the past and present executive directors of UNEP. She has interviewed and spoken to the executive secretaries of uh, multiple agreements, including myself, when I was Secretary General of CITES. And she's also engaged with member states and uh, members of civil society. So we are delighted to have Maria with us today. Perhaps we can bring Maria up on screen rather than this slide, because I'd, I'd like to see Maria as we kick off this session with her. Um, Maria, you're going to be talking to us about UNEP and MEAs, past, present, and future. There couldn't be a better person on planet Earth to talk to us about that. And Maria, you are the author of this book. And I'm not sure whether oh, you have it there as well, Maria. Brilliant. <laughs> the untold story of the world's leading environmental institution. Maria, you've done groundbreaking work on UNEP. Could you give us a little bit of an introduction perhaps to your book and just your overall sense of where we are uh, with UNEP and MEAs, looking back, looking to today and looking into the future? John, thank you. Thank you for engaging me in, uh, in, this, in this forum. I'm uh, happy to also note that I, I was hosting one of these discussions in, in this series of events, so indeed, all of us are working together in uh, in this setting. It has been uh, it has been quite a few decades, indeed. And so to see <laughs> things coming to fruition, coming together as we prepare for Stockholm Plus Fifty, is uh, is inspiring. And this brings me back to a time when. Uh, John, we convened in Lyon in Switzerland, mm -hmm. bringing all of UNEP's executive directors at the time, in 2009, there were five of them, uh, together to think about the past, reflect on the past, and imagine the future of UNEP and global environmental governance. And uh, we actually connected generations then. We had the people who not only led UNEP, with Mustafa Morris Strong and Mustafa Toba and Elizabeth Dowdswell and Klaus Topfer and Achim Steiner, but also the people who imagined UNEP. Mm -hmm. uh, Ambassador John McDonald in the United States, who was in the US uh, State Department and imagined a new international organization. And what struck me at that gathering, which is very relevant to what we're doing today, is that as these founders of the system were talking and reflecting on what they had done, some of the young people in the audience that we had brought together from around the world sat back and said, oh my God, they have been doing that for 30, 40 years. Wow. And another part of the young people in the room said, wow, they have been doing that for 30, 40 years and they're still going and they're still so committed and so excited. And so I think today we meet in that, in that sense that we have been at this for a while and yet we're committed and we're still excited and we're still inspired to go on. So um, it's in that spirit that I say, yes, I am a scholar of UNEP, a student of UNEP, a scholar of UNEP. I have studied the institution. I have written now, unfortunately, the only academic book about UNEP. The World Bank has over 100 books. The WTO has over 100 books. Oh, CITES has a book. Uh, and uh, <laughs> this is now the first academic book. There have been others, but it's the academic book. And... Um, what brought me to this is how important UNEP is as an institution and how underappreciated it is. 
And so it is in this spirit that I, I wrote this, uh, this book that I'm so glad you, you flagged up, The uh, Untold Story. Uh, <laughs> where this is the advertisement of the world's leading environmental institution. And so the title uh, betrays my bias. I do think that UNEP is the leading environmental institution. So um, it's in, in that capacity that I'm here. I'm happy to talk about the, the relationship between the multilateral environmental agreements and UNEP, but governments created UNEP to be small, nimble, flexible, to be the environmental conscience of the world and to make others do the work. And so I'm happy to talk about this in whatever way you, you'd like to. Excellent, thanks, Marianne. I really appreciate your everlasting enthusiasm for the topic, notwithstanding that you've been at it for so long. And can I just clarify one thing with you to start, Maria? Because we often hear people talk about this, this 500 or 1,000 MEAs. Um, you know, and, and I personally find that figure a, a little bit misleading uh, in terms of what we're really dealing with here. What, what is your sense of this figure of up to 1,000 MEAs and um, is it really that many? And how many do we really need to worry about from a global context? So it is over a thousand MEAs. I'm going to share the screen right now. I know I, you will have to bear with me because it will show you the other parts of it. But uh, Maria, I have it if you'd like me to put it up. Um, you only have part of it. So um, you can see all of the slides, but forgive me for that. At the moment, there's just a little bit of a technical glitch. But so you see this, here's the environmental agreements, right? That it is 1400 almost here. So on the face of it, that statement is very correct, John. Oh yes, we have over 1200 environmental agreements. And look at this, of how this has happened. This has come about over the years. And we see that uptick in the 1970s and uh, more and more in later years. So yes, that statement is true. However, that statement includes all kinds of bilateral agreements, all kinds of different international agreements. This is not how many global environmental agreements we have. So if we look at UNEP's own analysis of that or the UN's analysis, um, we see it is between 15 and 20 global agreements. And when I say global, that means that they are focused on an issue of global character that is uh, biodiversity or chemicals or the uh, loss of endangered species and, and so forth, uh, ozone, climate. So it's a global issue that encompasses the, the entire uh, planet, but it also has a lot of, uh, it, it has global universal membership. So these are open to uh, membership from um, any country in, in the world. And it is, it is only about 10, 15, uh, 20 of, of those. And this is, we, we study this at the Center for Governance and Sustainability that I direct. And uh, you can see them in the different, different clusters. So, and I can even show you, uh, since I did manage to bring this up, but uh, a little bit a little bit later, kind of the analysis that we've done, not only of the existence, but then what happens in terms of implementation. That's very helpful, Maria, to, to set the context here. And um, you've been looking at uh, these agreements from many different perspectives, including uh, from the implementation perspective. We may not be able to get to that much today, given the time. What I would like to ask you about in terms of UNEP and MEAs, I mean, UNEP is the global authority on the environment within the UN, that, that's unequivocal. At the same time of these up to 20 global MEAs, UNEP hosts only a few of them. Uh, it's not responsible for administering them. And some people often raise that as an issue as to um, a concern that UNEP and its headquartered duty station of Nairobi is not hosting and administering these agreements. Could you give a sense of how that came about? You know, this we have a, a landscape of multiple agreements in multiple locations with multiple administrative entities. How that came about, do you think that's a problem? Is that diminishing from uh, UNEP? And what do you see as, as the way forward? So 
<laughs> there are multiple views on uh, on this. There, indeed, we have a lot of agreements. I mean, we have a lot of issues. They started. Mm -hmm. These agreements came before UNEP was uh, was created. Indeed, I was delighted to host Marta Rojas, um, who is the Secretary General of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands, and we celebrated the Ramsar. Uh, 50th anniversary because Ramsar started before UNEP was created. Um, we we had a number of uh, conventions that that came about before uh, UNEP was created as an institution. And so, while they have gravitated toward UNEP, and then UNEP has catalyzed several of these uh, uh, agreements afterwards, it is by no way it is in no way kind of a, a done deal that, oh, these have to be part of the United Nations Environment Program. It was not the original design. It was not the original vision. Should it be is another story. And there are some scholars and policymakers who will say, if we have an environmental, what I call anchor institution for the global environment, it also has to contain the various agreements. I am of a different uh, inclination. I do not think that UNEP's comparative advantage is in administering the environmental conventions, in uh, telling what needs to be done on the different issues. UNEP's comparative advantage is to actually see the 3,000 piece puzzle from 30,000 feet up. UNEP is the only international organization with explicit mandate for environment Every other one has functions, has some mandate in environment. Yes, the uh, one you led, CITES, works on endangered species, actually in trade in endangered species. Uh, it's not even all of it. Um, in, or we have the Ramsar Convention on wetlands. Which, what is the organization that can bring all of them together? It is UNEP. Does it have to have all of them in its own orbit? to administer them? No. But what it has to have is the authority that people would want to be led, that people would want to follow, that they would say, yes, this is the place where we come for direction. This is the place where we come for inspiration. And so I am from, uh, of that uh, inclination is that UNEP needs to inspire, it needs to connect, it needs to collaborate, and not necessarily administer the operations of these, uh, of these various agreements. Very good, Maria. Very well said. And as you know, I find myself in agreement with you. Now, Maria, what about, um, we often hear about the, you know, the synergies and interlinkages and coherence and um, programmatic coherence. How can UNEP go about, given that it doesn't administer all of these 20 or so global agreements, given that they're not all hosted in the, the duty station, either headquarters or its regional offices, what can UNEP do to bring these MEAs together and bring about some programmatic coherence. What, what do you think they could do in a it could do in a practical sense? We often ask that question. UNEP calls it synergies, uh, which might be a little bit of a um, sl it's technical a technical term, but you're absolutely right. Is bringing them together, and I think that's your answer, John. Mm. How do you bring them together? By bringing them together. Mm -hmm. And uh, how can that happen? Why would people want to be brought together? They will come if there is something to come to. And this is where I think the reform of UNEP and the creation of the UN Environment Assembly as a universal body is absolutely critical uh, because not only does it bring all member states but it also is the one space for environment in the world where all organizations that do environmental work can come. And so the answer to your question on how can UNEP do, do that is by providing something that all of these organizations would want to be part of. And 
honestly, there is no one answer for this. Every year, it will be different. Every, yeah. every time, it will be different. And so for that, UNEP has to stay on the edge. It has to be out in the world. It has to be better. It has to be nimbler. It has to be the place where people want to be. And uh, how you do that is by engaging people who give you that, who exude that. Mm -hmm. And um, so hire more, hire uh, widely, hire diverse people and, uh, and have them speak to the rest of the world about what you're doing really well. So UNEP needs to be more visible and we all can help in that. Absolutely, and you've been at the forefront of that uh, that effort there, Maria. Now, Maria, you're not just looking at this from a global context, and I know also that you've been very active in in helping advance the um, uh, the efforts to have a plastics uh, a convention on plastics pollution, and we can talk about that uh, perhaps another day because we could talk for that uh, a long time. I'd like you also to talk about the excellent work you've done on implementation because you're not just looking at the global architecture; you're drilling down to see how individual multilateral environmental agreements are actually being implemented, which is something that hasn't surprisingly got the attention that one would think that it, uh, it would have. Could you tell us what you're doing there? Because it's very interesting. Okay, and that's where I'll share the screen again. And uh, again, excuse my, uh, the imperfect sharing here. Um, but yes, we have created the Environmental Conventions Index that actually measures the extent to which countries implement the conventions. There are these various policy processes in all of the conventions. It's, uh, it's actually pretty standard that they all deal with legislation and regulation and management and institutions and, and so forth. And yes, we'll hear from Amy and, and from Marta and you'll see this, they, they are the leaders of the conventions. You were one of those. And uh, we have created the Environmental Conventions Index that actually takes the national reports that countries submit to the secretariats and uh, ranks or codes the, the questions. And here, Marta, is one question that, for, uh, as an example from, uh, from the Ramsar Convention, is a national wetland policy or an equivalent instrument in place? And uh, the uh, options for answering yes, in preparation, it's planned, no information. And you see then how we code that uh, from zero to five. And as a result, we produce these heat maps for, for the world that shows to what extent, whether and to what extent countries implement the agreements that they have uh, signed on to. And this is on uh, the Basel Convention on Transboundary Movement of Hazardous Waste. And may I draw the attention to the rather counterintuitive and positive story that many developing countries are actually implementing the convention that they have agreed to. And that is a story that we don't know about. And this is what, what we're doing. Uh, for Stockholm and persistent organic pollutants, it's uh, much along the lines of a conventional wisdom. Industrialized countries perform better than developing countries do. And we can talk a lot about why, but the capacity, the technical issues are really important. And uh, the dark gray is where countries have not reported. And here, Ramsar, with the convention with the highest number of questions and the largest, the highest reporting rate. And I'd love to hear from Marta, how do you inspire countries to actually report? 100% reporting rate from Africa. I mean, that's really, it, it's, it, it's astounding. And well, your own convention uh, does not that report that well. Uh, and I <laughs> oh, no, Mary, we should, we should stop with that lovely story about Ramsar there, I think, with 100% reporting. <laughs> well, yes. And then, I mean, we could go into how different countries do, uh, but we're not going to cover this, this now. I know there's a lot of work to, to do, but this is the point that I just want to uh, get across. We have analyzed in aggregate, and then we could zero in on several countries, and we find very positive, very counterintuitive stories. So look at this on CITES, Malaysia. And this, these are stories that then you would know, John, and that, you know, both the, the people who who lead these conventions, but also those who work in them can, can uncover and tell us why we have these positive stories. Look on Ramsar, Fiji and Senegal are um, 
leading. This is actually for, for a group of, of people that for uh, countries that we we had a training course on last last summer. So it's not in the entire world. This is just for those who were part of that discussion. I will put the link to the article that we have published in, in the chat and so people can, can see what, uh, what we have. Um, all right. Brilliant. Maria, that's fantastic. Sadly, we're going to have to leave it there because we could speak for hours together. Uh, but I do hope that through this presentation, we've whet everybody's appetite in several ways. Firstly, to look at what you were just talking about there with the implementation and the link that you're going to show to an article, but also to have a, a read of this wonderful publication, first academic publication on UN Environment Program. It's a great read. If you want to know more about what Maria said, grab a copy and read it. Maria, um, the... Um, Professor of Global Governance at the University of Massachusetts, Boston. Thank you very much for joining us. Stick around and you're going to hear from other colleagues uh, who I'm sure will pick up some of the topics that you've uh, touched on today. Thanks again, Maria. Wonderful. We see that our slides come up and we're delighted to have as our next speaker, Amy Frankel, who's the Executive Secretary on the Convention on Migratory Species. Uh, Amy has vast experience within the United Nations, uh, and she also had a lot of experience in government in the US before she entered the UN. Delighted to have Amy with us today. Um, let's bring Amy up on screen, brilliant. Amy, fantastic to see you again. Now, Amy, um, the Convention on Migratory Species has a particular uh, relationship with uh, the Stockholm Conference of 1972, and. Perhaps everybody's not familiar with that uh, interrelationship between uh, your convention and Stockholm. So it'd be great. Could you tell us uh, why the CMS is linked to Stockholm 1972? And why do you think uh, the delegates to that conference decided to give this issue of migratory species particular attention uh, during that founding conference? Uh, well, thanks very much, John. It's a uh... Pleasure to be here and uh, to, to see you and, and other colleagues again. Uh, yes, it's true that uh, one of the key areas of focus of Stockholm was in fact uh, on, well, you know, it was a, on, the, on the need for international cooperation, first and foremost, to achieve shared environmental change. But what some people might not know is that one of the recommendations, recommendation 32 of the action plan that was adopted at Stockholm specifically recognize the need for an international convention to protect migratory species. So the Convention of Migratory Species was actually negotiated shortly thereafter and was adopted in Bonn, Germany, where I'm sitting now, in 1979. Now what's interesting is CMS truly puts into practice one of the most important outcomes of the Stockholm Conference, which is known as Principle 21. Now, Principle 21 recognized the balance between the right of countries to exploit their own resources, their sovereign right, against the duty to address the harms of their activities on the environments of other states. So the core purpose of CMS is in fact to address conservation issues that require the cooperation of two or more countries. Um, so if one country is not conserving a shared species, that species could go extinct in another country or throughout this range. And finally, CMS also provides a key means to address another area of focus of Stockholm, which is the so-called tragedy of the commons, where shared natural resources will be destroyed forever if there is no common effort to preserve them. So yes, we are deeply rooted and, and happy to have that uh, illustrious history uh, with ties to the Stockholm Convention uh, or conference rather in 1972. Fabulous, Amy. And I guess you'll be there for the 50th anniversary. I will indeed. Good to hear. Yeah, no, it's a very special occasion. As you know, CITES actually also had its uh, um, uh, a recommendation there that led to the, the finalization of those negotiations. So, you know, a big moment for those two uh, conventions that are very well interrelated. I mean, I want to ask you, because not everybody may be familiar with migratory species and uh, the threats to migra migratory species. Um, you're sitting at the center of this issue. Could you give us a sense of, you know, 
um, what are the biggest threat to migratory species and, and what sort of solutions are you looking at through the convention? Sure. And some of these are, are in common with other problems, but some are very specific to migratory species. So first and foremost is the issue of habitat destruction and fragmentation. It's one of the absolute major threats to, to migratory species, but it's also responsible for the general loss of nature and biodiversity, largely tied to agriculture, uh, but as well as other human activities. But coming to migratory species, uh, some of the less well uh, targeted uh, issues that we're now exploring is the over-exploitation of migratory species, which for some could be even a greater threat than habitat loss. And one area of that, which has had uh, really insignificant attention is the exploitation of species, not only for international trade, but for domestic use and for either domestic domestic use for food or for sale, for trade within a country, for, for um, income, et cetera. So that's an area that we are now really turning to and trying to raise uh, awareness around. Um, a third area is of course climate change. And for migratory species, uh, that involves several different aspects. One would be changes to important habitats that they rely on for either breeding, feeding, or, or a stopover site on migration as well as the shifting of the timing of, migra of migration in detrimental ways. So for example, if a species is getting to a, a place, a customary place on its migratory route, and there's not the kind of food there that it should normally be because of climate change, uh, that could impede its ability to you know, eat and get the strength and, and food it needs to finish its journey and, and go to its breeding site. The final area I'll mention is pollution. And that includes a, a wide uh, list of, of issues. Plastics is a big one, uh, and it's not only in the ocean, but we've recently done a study that, again, sheds light on a less well-known problem, which is plastic pollution affects terrestrial species and freshwater species as well. Uh, so that's a, a big issue for us. Pesticides is another. And I wanna, for a minute, just highlight light pollution. The light is something people don't sometimes think about as a, a source of pollution, but natural darkness is also a, a conservation value as much as clean air and clean soil. And for some species, they absolutely must have dark conditions for their, again, breeding, migration, uh, you know, habits. And on Saturday, May 14th, it's World Migratory Bird Day, and we will be launching our campaign on this very topic of light pollution. Great, thanks for that, Amy, and uh, we'll all look forward to that day. And I've seen your social media on that, which has been getting good pick up. And you've also done some excellent reports. The, you talked about the overexploitation issue, in particular the domestic overexploitation, and um, certainly refer people to your website to access these reports. They're they're, they're excellent. Now, Amy, I want to, you, you've touched upon global issues. You know these issues of pollution and plastics pollution and climate change, but. The global challenges you know, that are being talked about uh, are dominated by issues like climate change and sustainable development, food security, and more recently this year issue of you know, zoonotic diseases. Um, how would you say the work of the Convention on Migratory Species is relevant to, to these global issues? Yeah, no, thanks for that question. And maybe I'll answer in two ways. First, you know, species are the face of nature. I mean, they're tangible at the local level, at the regional, at the global level. Uh, when people think of nature, I think they first or often they'll think about species. And it's species, if we're talking about ecosystems and we're trying to protect ecosystems, we can't really have ecosystems without species. I mean, they're obviously, you know, integral to healthy and well functioning uh, ecosystems, which we rely on for for life as we know it, for our water supply, for our food supply, for cleaning the air, for mitigating climate change. So first they're part of functioning healthy ecosystems. And when you start to exploit uh, migratory species, you're also uh, un damaging and un the underpinning of, of a healthy ecosystem. But the second is, you know, all of the, the on migratory species is actually very relevant to the broader issues you, you mentioned. For example, 
a key solution that we see is this concept of ecological connectivity, which basically says, you know, for migratory species, they have to move, they have to go from place to place. And following that pattern is actually a very helpful roadmap for looking at sustainable development. It's, a, it's related to spatial planning, it's related to saying, what areas you know, can we in our country, uh, what, what's the most important areas for us to protect in some way? And what areas are well suited for energy infrastructure and agriculture and other activities? And how can we do this in a balanced and a harmonious way uh, to achieve sustainable development? So that tool, uh, it's very powerful. And it's, again, one of our priorities is, is to ensure that we conserve and, and remove barriers to uh, connectivity. Um, second, the conservation of migratory species is also absolutely essential for food security and for economic well-being. For food security, there are, first of all, many types of species that are relied on for food, including any fish species that are hunted. And so making sure it's done in a sustainable well, way is, of course, needed to, to ensure we have species and food supply for the future. Um, but also, there are many directly uh, measurable contributions that species make, such as pollination, uh, seed dispersal, and, and other uh, functions that uh, are very important for human activities. Um, finally, on zoonotic disease, uh, absolutely. And one of the key issues is to ensure that we have good conservation and management practices to reduce the risk of future zoonotic disease which can come from over-exploitation or over-destruction of habitat that bring human activities in close proximity to wild species. Great. Thanks, Amy. And you make a compelling case uh, for migratory species and uh, how they're interconnected to these, these uh, larger global issues that uh, attract so much attention. If I could just put you on the spot, in 30 seconds, if I said, if there's one recommendation you'd like to see come out of Stockholm 2022, what would that be? That one recommendation would be to stop talking about what's needed to be done and agree a very short list of the top priorities that cut across all of the different areas of, of drivers of destruction of the environment and nature. Uh, there is a very long list of issues, but if we can come up with an agreement on here's the top three things that have to be done in this set time frame, I think that would go an incredibly long way uh, to turning around some of the alarming trends that we see, including for our migratory species. Great. Thanks, Amy. Stay with us. I can see that there's um, a question that's already come directed your way and uh, the way of uh, CITES. So great chatting. And uh, we'll now turn to our third speaker, uh, Marta Rojas Urego. And Marta is the Secretary General of the uh, International Convention on Wetlands. Uh, great to see you, Marta. And maybe we can pull down the slides so we can see Marta there. Uh, Marta's had a, a very long history of involvement with uh, conservation in her home country, Colombia. She was head of national parks. She was with IUCN. And she's also uh, been involved in the, in the social side of things um, through her work with Care International. And now she's been Secretary General of uh, Ramsar Convention or Wetlands Convention, I think for about five or six years now, uh, Marta. Yes, thank you, John. Uh, it's really a pleasure to, to join this discussion and I'm glad to see many of, uh, of you, friends, colleagues. Uh, it's so great to see you there, Marta. And we, we, were, we have a topic for you and we'd like to throw that to you. We might ask you some questions as well, but um, uh, it's sort of very similar to Amy's in some way, her last question, but it's the contributions of the Ramsar Convention on Wetlands to achieve global environmental commitments. Over to you, Marta. Thank you, John. So it's it's uh, very interesting to hear the, the few speakers and of course this occasion uh, where we are discussing 50 years you know, from the landmark Stockholm Convention is of course a good time to reflect, you know, on, on what we have achieved or have learned, but also looking at the future. And, and this is even more relevant to the Ramsar Convention because um, we heard from Amy that uh, the Migratory Species Convention was actually mandated from Stockholm. And what is interesting is that the Ramsar Convention came before Stockholm. 
So uh, the conversion was signed in 1971. Yeah, so that was one year before Stockholm. But I think that this reflects a very interesting moment in terms of, of the environment that governments were, you know, there was this interest in looking at what are issues, problems that need to be solved, and how you know, this uh, derived in terms of uh, a set of conventions, including the United States Convention and Lancet across society. So what I would like to, to mention is the important role that these conventions have to address the critical issues uh, uh, of the environment, that is what Stockholm was about. Um, and Maria mentioned, actually, there are many issues, uh, but actually there are some conventions that address very specific issues. And I think that this is really important to highlight because we heard you know, from migratory speaking, um, the, what Amy mentioned, from the one convention perspective, it is the convention that is focused on one very specific issue. And it's the conservation of water that is ecosystem, it's called wetland, and this includes inland waters and marine and coastal. So it's the only convention that is focused on one ecosystem. Uh, but when you look in the like environmental space, there are so many issues that need to be addressed. And if you look at biodiversity, you see that wetlands house 40% of all species. And they are the most threatened ecosystem today. We have lost 85% of the surface of wetlands. So if you want to preserve biodiversity, this convention has a very important role to play. If we look at climate change, actually wetlands are the most effective carbon storage. They store more carbon than all the forests in the world. So if we want to address climate change, this convention has a very specific contribution. If you think about water, you know, water, fresh water comes from water. So, you know, it is the convention that is focused on a very specific issue that is very relevant to the different environmental and, and challenges that we have before us. But this convention also has some operational contributions that are very important to the future of home and which are critical to you know, achieve the environmental goals. Well, first of all, you may see that we have some lawyers around. These are legal treaties that are ratified and implemented by member states. In the case of our convention, we have 172 contracting parties. This is reflected in national legislation, as we know from, from different countries, from Rwanda and Australia. They also have actually developed action on the ground, you know, 172 countries in you know, the taking action. And from our convention, uh, with example, the establishment of more than 2,400 weapons of international importance. So this is the largest network in this particular area. So when we think about this target that we are trying to have of having 13, so 13, if we want to have targets of effective areas, having you know, this convention contributing with this network is very, very relevant. But this convention and others have also developed policy, legislation, tools, scientific guidance. This morning, I was in a webinar where we were launching some specific guidance on you know, blue carbon ecosystems and peoples. How do you know, like, to use these ecosystems for climate change? So we have you know, like, all these tools and mechanisms that are out there that are being used. And we have reporting and monitoring the nation data. And I was glad to hear my friend Maria you know, like mentioning the good reporting data of the Ramsey Convention. So this is 172 states reporting on the status of wetlands and on different issues. Why we are good at that? I think that there is a lot of support from the Secretariat as to contract the you know, to have this good place. But I think that beyond that, it shows you know, that we, as we want to you know, we need to measure environmental status we have this convention providing very specific data. So if we look at the future, it seems very logical that we need to harness and leverage all these instruments to deliver on common goals and targets. And we heard you know, that I think there is a lot of discussion about synergy. But I think that sometimes, you know, like it, it was good to put the numbers that Maria provided because it seems that there are so many conventions. But when we look at the actual conventions that we have, she mentioned 20, we have eight which are biodiversity related. So they are there. So how can we leverage them and use them to achieve our common goals? A second point I think in terms of what to do is to avoid duplication. We have seen, I'm sure that all of us have seen how sometimes agencies and conventions repeat things. 
So how can we avoid that? And really use this kind of service in a more effective way. I think that there are also opportunities to be really good in collaboration. For example, with CMS, we have a joint flow program. We have a joint flow program with the CDD. So there is already collaboration, even to collaborate with our partners. So how can we manage to deal with that? And finally, I think that we are in a very good moment because we have very powerful frameworks that can be used to create really good international collaboration. We have the OPT. And we have not the global biodiversity framework. So what we need to ensure is that, for example, the global biodiversity framework is for all of us. You know that it leverages the use of the convention, that it uses the data that we are providing, you know, which serve also LPT. So if we have a good framework, synergies will happen. I think that when synergies are tried to force at the end, it's more difficult than creating something that allows for this collaboration. So in conclusion, I think that. As we are celebrating the 50 years of Stockholm, I think that we need ambition because the, the problems that we have in the environment are bigger than ever, they are affecting our lives. So, a first step is how can we leverage what we have to try to create new common approaches, and in this way, we can deliver more impact. So, these are, these are the contributions uh, that I would like to mention, and I'm happy to respond to your questions. Great, thanks very much, Marta. And it's lovely to hear from a, a convention that predates Stockholm. It was the first convention, I think, to be ratified and the uh, multilateral environmental agreement to be ratified at a global level and the second to enter into force, uh, I think, shortly after CITES. Uh, so, Maria, some people I saw in the chat box were having difficulty hearing you. I, I, I could hear you, but some others had difficulty. So what I might do is come back to you at question time, just with uh, throw to you um, a question about a a recommendation you would make. I know you talked about ambition um, and you very clearly articulated the connection between wetlands and other agendas, the biodiversity agenda and the climate agenda in particular. But I'll come back to you when we come to Q&A just to ask you if you were to make one recommendation, what would it be? But if you could just check your sound in the, the, your microphone in the meantime so that we can all capture that. As I said, I could hear you. It was a little bit muffled, but we'll, we'll grab your uh, recommendation at, at Q&A if that's all right. But thank you very much, Marta. And I think you're doing a fantastic job there connecting uh, a convention with a specific mandate with all of these larger agendas and showing how important that is for implementing um, uh, critical issues on, on wetlands. With that, we're going to move to our fourth and final speaker for this session, uh, Carolina Caceres. Uh, Carolina wears multiple hats. Uh, she is with the Canadian government as the Director of uh, International Biodiversity. And she is also the chair of the CITES Standing Committee. That is a governance body uh, within CITES uh, that sits under its um, Conference of the Parties. Perhaps we can throw to Caroline there. Welcome, Carolina. Lovely to have you here. Nice to see you, John. And Carolina, uh, we're in particular uh, very interested in talking to you today about uh, the perspective of a party. Um, you are in government in Canada. Uh, in that capacity, you were elected as chair of the CITES Standing Committee. And I, I might say you've done an extraordinary job as chair for many years now, but you also in other roles uh, under other conventions and you're familiar with the CBD and CITES and CMS and, uh, and Ramsar and, and the whole body of, of conventions. But very interested in getting your perspective from a, a party. You know, we've heard from an academic, uh, we've heard from convention secretariats, but we've also heard from uh, Maria about how since 1972, we've seen an enormous amount of international lawmaking. And Maria put a figure of 12 or 1400 agreements uh, albeit if you look at the global agreements, we're probably looking closer to 20. Now, you've served with the Canadian government for a long time. Uh, you've been working with a number of conventions, as I just mentioned, uh, as well as with regional agreements, I should say. Um, and could you just give us a sense of how, um, as, a, as a person who represents a state party, um, how do you manage your relationship with so many different conventions? <laughs> That's a great question, John. Um, and uh, you know, I'll be frank right from the beginning, we, as we all know with 
there's never enough people to meet the demands. There's always more we could be doing. There's always an action that could be improved. And so it's it's always a bit of a of a struggle to try to figure out how to to best use use the resources we have in a party to really address um, issues. And so I think to to Amy's final comment there about priority setting, and I think that's a big part of how I manage our relationship with a number of different conventions and MEAs as a party. Um, I, th I think to Canada. So what are our priorities as a party? What, what drove us to join this agreement in the first place? What do we want to accomplish in this agreement for conservation, for wildlife, for whatever um, outcome we're trying to achieve? And from that lens, I can then look at each agreement where I uh, have a role and, and think about, so of the Canadian priorities, where are they cross-cutting? Where, where can I see that we can um, work collaboratively in both agreements to try to achieve a certain outcome? And I'm always looking for those outcomes. Um, and again, because, because we're trying to figure out where to put the resources we have to most effectively achieve whatever our goals or priorities are. The other great thing about being involved in more than one MEA is to be able to take lessons from one to another. And so I saw some of the Q&A in there, and there was a question about engagement of Indigenous peoples. So in my work with the um, representing Canada in the Convention on Biological Diversity, I've really seen how that convention works to engage various stakeholders and engage Indigenous peoples in their unique role and relationship. Um, I can take some lessons from there and think about how I can apply those lessons to the work we bring to the CITES Convention or to some of the regional work we do um, in Canada, like um, in, the, in the Arctic, for example. Um, and so, I mean, I, I think my short answer to your question is I manage those relationships by focusing on our priorities and then also by um, networks, making sure I, I create the right relationships with the right, with my colleagues who are representing Canada and other uh, uh, MEAs and making those linkages between the MEAs that I'm working on to, to, to see how I can, I can leverage both to achieve particular priority outcomes. Fabulous. And um, I, I've seen for myself how engaged you are there. Now, this, this might be a little bit repetitive, but I, I want to just explore this a little bit more. As, as you know very well, every convention has its own mandate it has its own governance process. It has its own program of work. So it has its own budget. So they're, they're very focused on mandate, governance, program, budget. And uh, they're very keen on delivering against their own mandate. At the same time, we hear calls for better coherence, synergies, interlinkages, whatever you know, language we want to use. Now, you've chaired the CITI Standing Committee for a long time now. You've been hearing this debate from many perspectives. You've also heard it within Canada. Could you give us a sense, you know, how do you deal, firstly, in a CITES context, managing an intergovernmental process through the Standing Committee, and how as Canada, uh, do you actually manage all these calls for, for synergies, coherence, um, interlinkages, given that each instrument has its own mandate, et cetera? That's also a fantastic question, John, and it's certainly something that we've struggled with a lot. And I wouldn't even say struggled, I think worked with a lot. Um, and so, uh, well, you know me well, John, I'm a doer. I like to see action and progress. And so I am really a person who focuses on the outcomes. And, and when I think of synergies, I think of it as a process. It's not an outcome, it's a process. And so the question I like to ask is, so what is the outcome we want to achieve with a particular process? And once I understand that goal that we want to achieve, the making those right linkages and synergies seems to fall into place. Um, and I have some fantastic examples from the CITES arena, um, just to start with. So uh, Amy spoke a lot about what the CMS does on, on species conservation. The, the CITES mandate, as was noted, is, is, a, is a fairly single-minded mandate. It's a mandate about ensuring that international trade does not pose a threat to species. But we all know that species face multiple threats. Um, international trade is rarely the sole threat for a species. And so we're looking at this one threat in the context of all those other threats. I don't think it would serve the CITES convention well to try to address all those threats. It wasn't designed to do that. And that comes back to that question about mandate and intent. Um, 
But what ha has worked really well with CITES is making those strong synergistic linkages with other conventions like CMS who are addressing different threats or approaching species from a different way. Um, and so we've got some fantastic joint work programs with the CMS on African carnivores, on cats. Um, we also work really uh, closely with FAO because there's a number of marine species who are being considered from an international trade threat, but there's a lot of work being done on marine species, a lot of support from the FAO in terms of understanding um, and evaluating the status of these species, for example. And of course, um, CITES is focused on ensuring that trade, international trade is legal and sustainable, but there's a lot of illegal trade happening out there. Um, we've got, we've worked with Interpol and UNODC and other partners to create a number of different uh, ways of approaching that. Um, and I think the International Consortium on Combating Wildlife Crime is one of those success stories. These are all examples of synergy, but they're very focused examples that are intending to achieve a particular outcome. Um, an, another one that's on our horizon right now is we, the CITES Convention through the Standing Committee has a, an agreement with the um, World Organization for Animal Health, the OIE. And so with all the, the concerns around um, pathogen transmission and the role in, uh, wildlife trade can play in that, there's, there's a strong desire by state countries and parties to, to make sure that we address that risk and the role that wildlife trade plays in that risk. So rather than taking this on into the standing committee as a, as a function, um, we're looking to those partnerships. We know that the OIE has that expertise in terms of sanitary measures and whatnot. And so rather than trying to recreate and duplicate, we need to really um, leverage that partnership where we can bring the CITES expertise on wildlife trade and they can bring their expertise and together we can look to devising tools that can help parties make um, the decisions that they're seeking assistance on. Um, and so that's kind of a CITES example. Um, you asked me as well about how we achieve it from a Canadian perspective. I think it's fairly similar um, and you know, similar to my answer to your previous question. <clears throat> um, Yeah, and I think, um, hmm, sorry, I've lost my train of thought there, John. Um, but yeah, from, from, from the Canadian perspective, it's the same thing. It's always looking for that outcome that we're trying to achieve in order to design the process that'll get us there the most effectively. Um, and the successes that we have ha felt in Canada are those ones where we know the, the aim we're trying to get to. Um, and, and really that ties right back into our, our uh, my comment about resourcing, human resources. There, we have limited bandwidth. And so we really wanna know that, we're, we're, um, that we understand and have that collective aim in mind when we are starting to build our relationships and our interlinkages. Fantastic, yeah, excellent examples. And I, I certainly saw for myself how what you were trying to achieve through the conventions you were implementing at a, at a domestic level in Canada and, and certainly with people like Sheldon Jordan, who was mm -hmm. doing a lot of the policing work and his uh, relationship with CITES um, were, were, was very strong there. Now, what I'd like to do is just ask you finally, you know, based on your vast experience, Carolina, and you've really worked across the conventions and, and at a domestic level, you know, we're here 50 years after Stockholm 1972 and we've, We've seen what's gone on and we've been talking about it. Look, looking 50 years ahead, if you were able to make one particular recommendation uh, to be adopted looking forward, what, what would that be? Um, I think now in these 50 years, it's a good time for a stock take. Like, like you mentioned in your introduction and, and Maria mentioned, there's a lot of existing agreements out there, um, a lot of actions that we've taken, a lot of um, multilateral connections that we've made to address really big global problems. And that, that has been, um, I think, a huge success that we have brought that our global attention to these issues. Um, but now, 50 years in, I'm at that place where I'm reminded again that, um, you know, Canada is a fairly well-resourced country, and yet it is still a struggle for us to try to really achieve everything we want to achieve with all of these different agreements that we are either a party to or even just participate in. And so I think in the next 50 years, I'd like to see a bit more of a stock take where we can start try to rationalize some of those. Um, and again, from that focus of an outcome so that when we're talking about synergies, we're not just 
we're really clear what we're trying to achieve with that. Rather than talking about synergies as an aim itself, we talk about it as a process and we understand that outcome that we want to achieve so that we can take these multiple important agreements that we have all signed on to and really leverage their individual mandates in a much more cohesive way. Excellent. Now, what I'd like to do, um, Carolina, is to ask you to stay in line because I've, we've got a few minutes for Q&A, uh, not a lot. I, I'd like to move to uh, a couple of questions that were asked about uh, Indigenous peoples and local communities. And I'd like to throw this question firstly to you, Carolina, while you've got the floor, and then come to Amy and to Marta. So we have a couple of questions about how Indigenous peoples and local communities can engage on CMS and CITES processes and how Indigenous peoples and local communities, their values, culture and spiritual relationship with wetlands and their contribution to wetland biodiversity. So the one on Ramsar is how the Ramsar Convention uh, has any focus on these issues and how can they engage? So. I'll start with you, Carolina, perhaps talk about uh, CITES, then Amy on CMS, and um, uh, Marta on Ramsa. Thanks, John. Um, that, that's a really great question, and that's a question that is um, being discussed by CITES countries in, in a relatively new way. Um, so CITES has a number of processes that allows for participation of, of, of observers or non-parties. Um, certainly CITES welcomes uh, participation in our scientific committees. The standing committee is, is well attended with um, representatives from various civil society organizations and at the conference of the parties. And I do, what a, one of the things I really like about CITES is in the um, development of our ideas and bringing things to conferences of parties, we do really seek a wide range of participation. However, of course, that does require the ability of organizations or individuals to get to those meetings, and that is not um, equal across all types. And for that reason, there has been an, an ongoing discussion that was first started by our colleagues in Africa about how we can better engage Indigenous peoples, local communities, rural communities in the CITES decision-making process. Um, it's, it's a nascent conversation, and it's one I think is very important in the CITES world because, as I've mentioned many times, for CITES conservation goals to work, people need to be a part of that. The people who are working and living with the animals that we're trying to protect need to be part of those conversations. And so this is where we can try to take some of the lessons learned from CBD or other um, MEAs and try to see how we can apply them in a CITES context. So while I think there's a space for it, I think we can do better in providing something that's more purpose-built to really focus on engaging Indigenous peoples, local communities in the CITES processes and the decision-making and in, in the implementation of those decisions in particular. Great, Carolyn. Thanks for the answer and thanks for the great insights you gave us uh, from a state party perspective. Really appreciate it. Stay with us. Um, Amy, I won't repeat the question. I think, uh, I think you heard it. Um, what's your perspective from a, from a CMS uh, standpoint? Uh, thanks for the question uh, to, to the person who posed it. And it's interesting because similar to CITES, in fact, uh, we have a resolution from our last CMS COP that asks us to look at um, how we can uh, make more effective the different engagement processes, um, not only for indigenous peoples and local communities, but, but some other uh, stakeholders. Uh, so we're looking at that. Uh, but we're already engaging with, uh, with Indigenous peoples and local communities um, in a very variety of ways. First is at the national level, and of course, first and foremost, it's parties, it's governments who are uh, implementing CMS, uh, not, not the secretariat. And so governments um, are very, they need to involve uh, local communities, uh, Indigenous peoples in many conservation efforts. Uh, sometimes it, you know it's those people who are closest to um, to a particular species or or use and will be best suited to know about its habits, its status, and and conservation solutions. Another aspect of this is looking at conservation approaches like sustainable tourism. And there's a lot of sort of claims flying around about you know different practices being beneficial to local communities. And I'm interested to really 
uh, learn more factually, you know, how much are local communities actually benefiting uh, from, for example, different um, hunting, you know, uh, uh, tourism and so forth, or from conservation. If you've got national parks to conserve a particular species, what's the finance model uh, to ensure that there is a local benefit? Uh, because we have to look at, you know, what's what are the incentives for local people uh, to contribute to the continued conservation of species as opposed to exploiting them for a, a short-term income gain. Um, so those are some of the, just very quickly, some of the things we're looking at. Maybe the last point is from a process point of view, we, you know, our process is also open to all observers, but as Caroline said, you know, it's certainly harder um, in terms of access, just from a practicality point of view, I think for some groups to, to do that. And, and we will be looking at that as part of our, our resolution process. Great, very, very good to hear that. Thanks, Amy. And Marta, are you with us there? Great. Marta, can, I won't can you hear me? Can you yes, hear me can, now? Can hear you, yes. Thank you very much. And um, as I said, I could hear you before, but I just noted the check box. Some people were, were finding it a bit more difficult. But Marta, over to you. I won't repeat the question. I, I think you've heard it. Yes. And um, from a Ramsar uh, wetland convention, how would you respond? Yes, thank you. And apologies that the sound didn't work because we tested before and I thought that it did. So sorry for that. So to respond to this question, yes, in the Ramsar. We've just lost you, Marta. I think you accidentally hit uh, your mute button. You've just gone up. Can you hear you me? I don't yes, know what yeah. is happening today. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sorry for that. So I was saying that the, the parties have agreed on a series of resolutions uh, that uh, deal specifically with the engagement of local communities and indigenous people and culture. And they develop guidelines on this. But perhaps uh, one interesting thing to share is that this convention that, as I mentioned, was signed in 1971, already in, in, in 1971, adopted the concept of wise use. So it's, it's, a, it's a convention that deals with conservation of wetlands, but also with wise use of wetlands. And the wise use, which is sustainable use, implies uh, and has embedded the engagement of people. So, so it's really interesting because it means, you know, like that it's not uh, as some conventions at the time that were putting wetlands aside or certain ecosystems aside. So the, the question of participation is very much embedded in terms of implementation. And for example, in terms of the guidance that is provided uh, for the establishment of Ramsar sites, uh, which are wetlands of international importance, the engagement of communities, the engagement of local governments is something that is very much embedded. So, so I think that that's, uh, that's an, an interesting you know, like perspective from a convention that dates already from 50 years ago. And finally, uh, although it's not about indigenous peoples uh, and local communities, but it deals with the question of inclusion and, and equity, uh, I think that it's, it's important to mention that um, at the last COP, uh, the Ramsar Convention adopted, uh, the Conference of the Parties adopted a resolution on, on, on gender and, and wetlands. And uh, it includes and refers to also knowledge of indigenous women. And we developed actually a guidelines on how to mainstream gender into wetlands. So although it's not in you know, like local communities or indigenous peoples, I think that is an important perspective in bringing participation, engagement, and equity. Fantastic, really interesting, Martha. And um, I've always been captivated by that phrase, wise use um, um, uh, with the Ramsar Convention. And Martha, I promised to come back to you because I, I wanted to capture this from you as well about um, looking forwards um, 50 years. So what's that, 2072? Um, if you were able to put one recommendation uh, before states to adopt uh, in June, what, what would it be? If I may, because uh, people didn't hear me, I would say two, if that's okay, moderator, yes, <laughs> very <course>. quickly. <laughs> uh, so the first one, I think that it's really important that we leverage these instruments that we have. I think that sometimes they are seen as, you know, like... Um, like outdated, but there I explained, you know, the importance that they have. So a key recommendation is how can we leverage and how can we strengthen the implementation of these instruments that we have that are adopted by different parties? And Carolina mentioned this as well. You know, how can we make them more effective as part 
of achieving, you know, like the global uh, environmental uh, goals. And secondly, is ensure, you know, like that these new global frameworks, and in particular, the global biodiversity framework, is inclusive and leverages these conventions and avoids duplications and rather, you know, like is used as a unifying framework that would allow us to have more connections, more priorities, and more impact. So these would be the two recommendations that I would make. Fantastic, yeah, good recommendations. And thank you to uh, the three of you, Carolina, Amy, and Marta for, you know, fantastic interventions. And uh, we can feel your enthusiasm for the subject matter, but uh, great depth of knowledge and you're, you're doing fantastic work right across the board. So really appreciate that. We're gonna move out of question time now. We will have question time at the end of the session as well. But for now, we will move to the second session and where we're going to have three speakers. And we're going to start off with Daniel Cashelrace. Daniel is the executive director of C Shepherd Legal. Um, perhaps we can get uh, Daniel on screen. There he is. I think he's going to be sharing a PowerPoint. Daniel, uh, uh, prior to being with C Shepherd Legal, uh, had uh, a great career with the CITES Secretariat. In fact, he joined the CITES Secretariat while I was there as a junior professional officer and was the first Marine officer ever at the CITES Secretariat. And I can say from uh, personal experience and personal observations, he did an extraordinary job uh, leading the CITES Secretariat effort in uh, embracing and uh, advancing the implementation of a, a vast number of Marine listings that were made uh, during the time that he was with the Secretariat. Now, Daniel, you are going to be talking to us about that issue, how marine issues can be embedded in multilateral environmental agreements using CITES as a case study. Over to you, Daniel. Thank you so much, Sean. First of all, making sure everybody can hear me all right. Yes, perfect. Okay, um, well, uh, thanks again for the introduction, John. Um, dear colleagues and friends, uh, as John just mentioned, I've been asked to provide a marine perspective to this webinar. Uh, very much drawing on the experience of CITES implementation for marine species. Very glad to hear Carolina refer to some of that work uh, in a very positive manner. Um, but I wanted to start off sort of with the question, why, why is there a separate uh, session on marine issues, for example, in this webinar? Um, and wait, right, slide is advancing. Um, so just a few key facts. Um, most of you will know more than two thirds of our planet's surface is covered by ocean. Uh, marine ecosystems produce over 50% of the oxygen uh, that we breathe and over 3 billion people depend on the oceans for their livelihoods. But despite all of that, the marine environment and marine species haven't always sort of been reflected at the importance that they have in international environmental discussions. And Part of that may be due to inherent challenges associated with regulating activities at sea. Uh, so being very remote, traditionally high costs of patrolling and enforcing regulations. Um, but there's of course also um, the matter that international environmental law and law of the sea tend to be seen as, as sort of parallel pillars um, with uh, a lot of the international environmental law emanating from Stockholm 1972, the Rio conventions, the bodies that, that, that were created in Rio, um, while uh, the activities at sea um, are fall under UNCLOS, um, which is sometimes referred to as the, in, uh, the constitution of the sea. And that was um, adopted in 1982. In some countries, uh, fish are not even considered uh, as wildlife in, in the definition. Um, and CITES provides a very interesting example in that regard because it was negotiated and adopted before UNCLOS was finalized. Um, but most of the, its recent work on marine species, on commercially exploited marine species, has taken place with all of the frameworks and institutions established in UNCLOS and the fish stocks agreement firmly in place. Um, I included a very short slide sort of to give uh, um, a CITES in a nutshell. Um, I think most of this has been covered already. So I'll just very briefly uh, go over this. Um, CITES, it regulates international trade. And very interestingly, that includes a provision called introduction from the sea, uh, which is uh, the transport of specimens from the marine environment outside of national jurisdiction into the territory of a state. Um, 
And Appendix 1 of CITES includes threatened species. Appendix 2 uh, includes species that are supposed to be um, managed um, and tra internationally traded legally and sustainably. Um, the two permits that um, uh, states issue to, to sort of verify this, uh, two uh, requirements for permits, one is a non-detriment finding, the other one is a legal acquisition finding. Um, there are annual reports. Uh, the convention puts some obligations on parties implementing its provisions through national legislation. And CITES is a voting convention. Um, so the decisions to add species to the CITES appendices, for example, marine species, is taken by COPS. And listing proposals to add commercially exploited marine species have been uh, quite controversial. I'm sure um, John and Carolina and others will remember uh, some very heated discussions at COPS about whether or not CITES is the right tool to regulate uh, international trade in, in, in commercially exploited marine species, um, and that CITES have, have no role in fisheries management. What's interesting in that regard is that drafters of CITES clearly had marine species in mind when they were initially drafting the convention, because it does include introduction from the sea as one of the types of trade regulated under CITES. Uh, there's a special consultation procedure for listing of marine species. And there is uh, also a provision that CITES should not prejudge further codification of UNCLOS. Um, it's quite clear from looking at the timeline um, that because UNCLOS II had already taken place and then sort of broke down, uh, and the PREPCOM leading up to UNCLOS III started in 1971, delegates obviously had uh, UNCLOS concepts in mind uh, and were. Uh, sort of taking them into account when they were negotiating the convention. So introduction from the sea is, is a really interesting provision um, in the sense that it's very clear that it's from pre-UNCLOS. It, it wouldn't have been drafted that way after UNCLOS. Um, and it applies to activities on the high sea, which under UNCLOS fall under the freedom of high seas. Um, and while the provision was in CITES since its beginning, it wasn't operationalized for a long time. And it was one of the things that was holding up uh, marine species listings. Um, and then it, it, and the COP in Bangkok uh, in 2013, um, Fabio Hazin of Brazil, uh, who unfortunately passed away last year, um, uh, proposed a solution to, to how to actually make it work in practice. And that is with the scenarios that are provided here in the slide, um, trying to, whenever two states are involved, it's handled as a normal import export under CITES, and it's only when it's a one state transaction, it's, uh, it's, it's a specific transaction called introduction from the sea. So with that unlocked, um, COP16 has been called a watershed moment uh, for, marine, for marine wildlife um, in CITES with, with some uh, commercially exploited uh, shark species being listed inside of Appendix 2. Um, and then you could sort of say the floodgates were open. Um, and what's interesting in this slide is there were actually quite a number of marine species on CITES all the time. Um, since 1975, some mammals, birds, reptiles, depending on how marine species are defined. What we're really talking about here is sort of the uptick on the upper right corner when we see commercially exploited marine species um, that interact with fisheries coming into the sort of into the fray. And um, it's interesting to look at, at some of the numbers uh, of trade transactions, but also of volumes that have occurred since. I'll go through this very quickly, but you can see that very clearly from 2013, this is sharks. There's a clear uptake in number of transactions but even more pronounced here, looking at volume of trade by species in, reported in kilogram. Keep in mind that bar in 2019, um, which skyrockets because this is just one year later, you can see that the 2019 bar has been completely dwarfed and um, the numbers for 2020 are, are much higher. Uh, Society is really playing a role in regulating um, international uh, fisheries, uh, commercial yeah, fishery, uh, species that are caught in conjunction with commercial fisheries. 
Um, so obviously, CITES was a new player on the block. Uh, and one of the things that, um, as John mentioned, uh, fell under my, my mandate at CITES was to work on um, helping parties and also uh, other stakeholders implement those listings. Um, because in the end, the listings are just the start. That's when the hard work uh, starts. And it's the implementation of the, those listings that see if CITES can add value. So referring to what Carolina was saying, does it actually do the job? Um, and luckily, the listings were flanked by a massive effort to support implementation, both uh, from, from IGOs, uh, st strong cooperation with FAO and some of the regional fisheries management organizations mentioned. Um, but there was also a, a massive amount of work being done by civil society in helping parties um, get in place what they need to make the listings work. And, um, right, next slide. So reflecting on that very briefly, um, so some learnings from, from socializing scientists and fisheries, um, dedicated funding for implementation support and capacity building definitely helped build bridges. Um, identifying challenges and deliver needs driven capacity building uh, also played a large role and there were some really good sort of pre studies of what countries actually um, said they needed uh, and partnerships are key across the board, um, both between IGOs, but also um, civil society really has helped at, at that time to uh, scale um, the, all of that effort reaching the national level. So that brings me to challenges. Um, as a relatively small secretariat, um, it's, it's of course, um, it was of course not easy to spread resources over 174 parties. Um, so balancing that reach of a regional approach versus precision is difficult and um, having local partners um, or, or NGOs or other, other actors that could reach to the national level is, is very important. Um, it was, a, it was great to be able to work on overcoming some of the old enmities and, and sort of uh, silos between fisheries and environment. But of course, that's a work in progress. Um, and introduction from the sea um, is, is, is a very complex matter, remains a very complex matter, but also progress is being made. Um, so I knew that John was going to ask for some recommendations. I'm sorry, it's not just one, it's four. Um, okay, give us four quick recommendations, Daniel, and then we'll then we'll wrap it up. Yeah. So, um, in sort of in order in order to overcome that sea blindness, I think it's useful to consider marine context and marine species when drafting laws and regulations. And a really good example is provided by the draft UNTOC protocol on wildlife crime that the End Wildlife Crime Initiative has put forward. Uh, which clarifies uh, that um, the intent is to include fish in the term wildlife and including introduction from the sea in the definition of trafficking. Um, both of that means it can be useful to address maritime crime um, if, if parties go with that approach. Um, also aiming for complementarity when designing measures, um, FAO Port State Measures Agreement uh, is a great example for that, has a specific um, part in the in the inspection that says uh, port authorities should also check for CITES permits um, or CITES documents. And then I think if I had to pick one, it would be really take that opportunity to create incentives to overcome silos as with the CITES capacity building projects. And if, if I had to sort of um, propose one to for parties to adopt at Stockholm Plus 50, I think it's it's really committing to creating these kind of, um, of financial incentives, but also the mandates accompanying them for um, IGOs to, to overcome their silos for the environment and fisheries uh, to come together and work on something together. Um, and then last, uh, as, as I mentioned before, partnerships, uh, both uh, between agencies, but also with civil society uh, have been key uh, in my experience in, in delivering that work. Thank you so much. Fabulous. Thanks, Daniel. And that's a, a really interesting case study, how uh, an old instrument, it's now almost 50 years old, could be uh, used to start to regulate trade in uh, commercial fisheries that previously wasn't the case. And um, uh, hats off to the parties. It was great to hear you talk about um, 
uh, Fabio um, uh, from Brazil, who did an extraordinary job in coming up with the, the ways and means of getting over this impasse about how you uh, would define introduction from the sea. He, he did an extraordinary job there, as did you, Daniel, in helping implement these listings and, and generating uh, enough confidence amongst the state's parties to continue to, to list additional species. So thank you very much for that and for the recommendations. And we're now going to move to our second speaker in this session, Patrick Tiefenbacher. Um, Patrick Tiefenbacher has had a very long and distinguished career in the UN. He's worked with the UN Environment Program. That's where I first met him, UN Development Program, UNOPS. Can't even remember what that acronym stands for. <laughs> Uh, Patrick can tell us, but there's no one uh, around who knows better the operational and programmatic and financial aspects of the, the United Nations and the system and all its funds and programs. Patrick has uh, uh, finished up as a staff member of the UN uh, a little while back and created uh, his own firm, which is Global Goals Consulting. He's the executive director there. He brings vast experience today. And what he's going to do is perhaps touch upon a topic that we don't address often enough. Uh, multilateral environmental agreements need to be implemented. They need to be implemented at a national level, but how does the UN system assist in that? And in particular, with reference to uh, certain work that's going on at the moment, this is country level pooled funds. So how can these, well, firstly, Patrick, what are country level pooled funds for people that are not familiar with it? And how can they work as a tool for programmatic coherence? And how is that relevant to multilateral environmental agreements? This will be interesting because I, I haven't heard this before and I doubt many of us online will have heard this intersection with MEAs. So Patrick, over to you. Great, thank you, John. And indeed, three really good questions that lead us a little bit from uh, the core aspects of what we've been talking about in terms of um, synergies among you know, the MEAs and of course their relationship to UNEP to a larger context, because um, as for instance, um, uh, Carolina mentioned in, in the very first uh, panel, um, her view is always to action and, and how can uh, we get to action? And one element that she pointed out was that collaboration is necessary. Uh, Maria also in her intervention also said that, you know, UNEP and DMEAs were designed to inspire, but but the work often needs to be done by others. And I think it's in this context that we really need to look at how uh, the implementation that you also referenced, the action on the ground really is embedded in a national planning process. Um, and it's in this context that I wanna talk a little bit about uh, some of the tools that are being used by the UN at large to support member states in their planning processes and to bring uh, a lot of different perspectives uh, to the table to facilitate the making of trade-offs, to facilitate that uh, often competing priorities can be addressed by all the state uh, stakeholders. So let me um, share with you um, a few slides just to make sure that um, you can all understand this a little bit better what I'm talking about. So first, John, your question was, what are country level pooled funds? And um, so the, the, the sim simplest way of talking about this is that they are uh, multi-partner arrangements that actually include several donors and several UN entities that come together to take action on the ground. One thing that is really important here is that um, they actually uh, share, sorry, um, they share a, um, a theory of change that is common to all of them. So in a way, what they do is there is some joint analysis that precedes what is actually happening uh, before action takes place. Uh, that's a really important step because what often happens uh, when UN entities come to the table otherwise is that there might be certain development organizations who all think that, well, we need to support uh, economic growth. There might be environment entities that say, well, we need to be all about um, uh, conservation, but it's not necessarily always clear about what stands behind some of these issues. Uh, pooled funds isn't per se a, a new tool. Um, it got started in, in 2002. Um, and the first reason why um, pooled funds were developed was because of the reconstruction effort in Afghanistan after the war. It was a huge effort 
Uh, and it was for the first time that the UN actually felt that they needed to team up with international financial institutions, in this case, particularly the World Bank, to ensure that the funding that is available for the reconstruction is sequenced and accessed in such a way that it, it actually optimizes the way of all the UN entities working together. So instead of each entity coming with its own little pot or each donor coming with, with its own ideas of how um, the reconstruction of Afghanistan should take place, uh, the idea of this uh, tool was to bring all the money together, bring all the stakeholders together, and actually have a mechanism to address these competing priorities, to address what is first priority, what needs to come later. Since 2002, we now have around 40 of these funds at country level um, that are under the control of the UN resident coordinator. Um, and so the UN resident coordinator plays in a way that facilitation role that allows all the UN entities to come in. It allows the donors to contribute to a larger pool. Uh, and so in a way they can also see how maybe just a few million here and there can leverage much, much larger results. In addition to these 40 country level pools, um, there are also global and regional multi-donor trust funds, some of which are actually quite explicit um, on environmental issues. So there is a Central African Forest Initiative that controls several hundred million uh, dollars of investments across several uh, countries um, that is very much there to implement UN RED. Or there is a, another uh, example of a fund around the ROC countries that are suffering from the effects of desertification and the drying up of the ROC. So in addition to the 40 funds here, um, you have other, other uh, global and regional funds that also fund and create frameworks around environmental issues uh, that are open to all UN entities. So again, what's the goal of, of these tools? The idea is to help uh, countries uh, access different types of funding, make sure that it is combined and sequenced in the right way so that um, all of the efforts is geared towards shared results by the stakeholders in line with national planning processes. The idea is to reduce fragmentation and duplication that otherwise would happen if all the UN entities individually come and have conversations with their national stakeholders uh, and, and just implement their own projects with their own money. And of course, another element here that is important is that these tools are intended to increase accountability um, towards the stakeholders to increase the transparency and information, who is doing what, uh, in which area of the country, you know, when is it taking place? And it's also an idea to create predictability of funding because these mechanisms are usually multi-year commitments. So unlike what often happens in other cases where entities only have money for one or two years, some of these funds can provide a five, 10 year horizon for funding for UN entities. Uh, to implement various projects. So what's the relevance for, for MEAs in this context? Um, first, um, there's a really important aspect that the Secretary General has emphasized this tool. And that's why I'm saying there's a new element to this. While we've seen that uh, country level pooled funds have been done for 20 years, it's really only with the Secretary General's reform agenda introduced in 2017 that there is now a target. And this target is that all UN entities in the development field, uh, together with donors, should reach a threshold of 15% of all their funding going into pooled funds. Um, where we are right now is that this actually translates to about 3 billion a year that is implemented through pooled funds. And we're still short of that target. So we are right now somewhere at around 9%. So there's still some, some, some scope to grow. But what you see here is we're talking about seriously big numbers here. And of course, when it's, once you break it down to uh, 170 countries where these funds potentially could take place, the numbers come down, but it is significant amount of money that are actually brought to these tools to actually coordinate the work of the UN. 
Um, the trends have been going up. I'm qualifying this somehow because uh, we don't quite know what the effects of COVID are. We don't fully understand yet the effects of uh, the war in Ukraine. So this could actually affect where, where the trend is going. But fundamentally, uh, all things being equal, what we see here is that um, these tools will have a significant influence on country level programming across the UN system. Um, and they also help overcome some of the challenges that we've heard about in the first, in the first uh, group of speakers, where um, it is sometimes a bit difficult for small entities that are uh, well situated in a scientific context to really impact uh, action on the ground because of the limited capacities that they have or because uh, they don't necessarily have the right entry places. And so pooled funds can offer this. Now, how exactly would this work? Um, and so what you see here is a, is a very simple chart of what a country level pooled fund can look like. Uh, at the very top, you have a financing strategy. So the idea of this financing strategy is that there is a logic how the money is being pooled, uh, which donors are contributing, um, are these international financial institutions, are these bilateral donors? Are these global funds like GF that are coming in here? So there is an idea of what is the universe of funding that we're trying to either access or bring to the table. Then on the uh, left side of this chart, you have um, the fund results framework. And this is a core element because it actually talks about, well, what is it that um, national stakeholders together with their international partners are trying to achieve? Um, and what we will see here is that one of the core elements of this results framework is this theory of change that I've talked about um, that actually helps people program and understand that we're all looking at these issues in the same way. Uh, what you see on the right side is the governance architecture. And that's another important element because this is a partnership instrument. There needs to be some mechanism that allows uh, the UN entities, the donors, the national stakeholders to come together and decide, okay, well, this pool of money, what comes first? What comes second? Who is responsible for administering the fund? Who will actually take actions based on that? And so what you see on the right is the actual uh, operationalization of this pool of funding um, that actually helps action take place on the ground. So where could NEAs now come in? One is that it is really important for these partners to have a sound theory of change. NEAs in particular often have insights in how uh, certain phenomena are working. So if we're talking about um, countries that are trying to uh, adapt to climate change, it is really important that um, that understanding is based on, on, on a good understanding of the science. And so um, MEAs can play a really important role in helping all stakeholders understand how these phenomena that might be development issues are actually underpinned by various environmental issues um, that we've also seen in, 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 last, in the last couple of years take more and more responsibility. Secondly, uh, MEAs can play a really important uh, role in helping stakeholders understand the risks that they're facing in implementation. Um, we've talked about um, the loss of habitat for wild animals suddenly becoming a risk to health. Um, some of these relationships have become more prominent now. Um, some of these relationships maybe are less known. And so MEAs can play a really important role in alerting and sensitizing stakeholders that even when they pursue development results, there might be risks that they are incurring because of chemicals that they're using, because of, of pollution that is, that is taking place, or because of some trade-offs that they're taking. And so these risks can then be addressed and brought into the consideration of these results and of the actions on the ground. And finally, one element, of course, that also could take place 
is that they're actually becoming directly involved in the implementation. And implementation in this context means really supporting national stakeholders in taking action on the ground. This could be because they need support in developing policies. This could be because there are issues of capacity building and knowledge transfer that need to take place. But this is an element where MEAs could really also benefit from larger pools of funding that are available, but they could tap into by providing really important uh, services that are needed by national stakeholders to really drive implementation forward. Um, so these are some of the key elements that I wanted to highlight. And um, with that, I'll stop and hand over to you, John. Great, thanks, Patrick. That's a really interesting insight into not only the pooled funds and how they work, but where the entry points are for multilateral environmental agreements. We know all agreements feel starved for funds, that it's very difficult to implement, but there is an entry point here to a very large pot of funds. And as you and all of our other speakers have talked about, there's the interrelationship with all these issues and all these risks. Now, Patrick, you, you come at this from a particular perspective, but I'd still like to know, you're going to stock on plus 50. If you had the chance to make one recommendation going forward for the next 50 years, what would that be? I think my biggest recommendation would be that we stop making an artificial differentiation between the de development organizations and the environment organizations. One thing that for me was very, in a way, unfortunate is that there is still a little bit two cultures that are taking place here. And I think if there is one thing that we've learned, uh, particularly also during the pandemic, is that um, we only stand a chance of really making fundamental shifts if we stop thinking around these uh, of these topics as separate communities and these communities start growing together so that instead of a development community or a health community or a humanitarian community or an environment community, we actually start seeing these cross linkages because one of the biggest issues for humanitarian organizations is of course, the effects of uh, environmental degradation and climate change. So they, will, they require that uh, we understand and provide uh, them with the, with the nexus issues that actually lead across. So that would be my wish uh, coming out of Stockholm. Great, thanks, Patrick. And that really links very well with what Amy, Marta and Carolina said in terms of the particular conventions they were looking to. Now we're gonna to move to our third speaker and our final speaker for this session and for today. Uh, delighted to have Hussein Fadai with us. Uh, Hussein uh, probably knows more about the United Nations, the United Nations system, what everybody's doing on the environment than anyone else. Uh, he is the head of the UN Environment Management Group. So he's sitting at the, the cutting edge of, of all of this and uh, perhaps picking up very nicely on what you were saying, Patrick, uh, different communities of interest and, and how the UN system uh, addresses environmental issues. So. We're saying we're delighted to have you with us. You're going to talk about multilateral environmental agreements and the UN system. Couldn't have any better, anyone better to be with us today to, to take on that topic. So over to you, Hussein. Thank you, John. Thank you, colleagues. And uh, this is an honor to be in this event. And I was just thinking that um, it couldn't be more relevant than anything else than to have this opportunity actually just before the uh, Stockholm International Meeting to actually reflect uh, also on the UN wide dimensions of multilateral environmental agreements and, and the correlationship. Um, and um, I think this is a great opportunity to offer some thoughts. I do not uh, claim that I have all of the informations and, uh, and um, a knowledge uh, of the UN system work at all levels. It, this is really from my very limited uh, understanding, especially at the global level. And I'm very pleased that Patrick was here to bring a very specific angle at the country level, which is really a, a, a dimension that requires a, a lot of attention in the future in terms of responding to country needs. But I have a few uh, points in a couple of uh, slides that I would like to share. And this is very humbly shared just to perhaps raise some questions for ourselves and having a basis for interactions, hopefully uh, in the future. But I'm very pleased also that some of the heads of MEAs already here, some of our colleagues and friends. So it's a privilege to, to be in this. So without further ado, let me just uh, jump into this um, uh, 
PowerPoint, if I could share it. Uh, I hope that you can see it. Uh, if I know. Yes, the... yes, we've got it. Thanks. Okay, great. Great. So um, let me just, in a very uh, brief manner, say what I'm supposed, what, what I'm actually willing and uh, intending to, to, to present here. Um, as you may know, the Environment Management Group, uh, where I work, uh, has uh, provided a UN system by perspective and, and input to the Stockholm Plus 15 International Meeting. And uh, th these inputs are mm, sort of uh, clustered and structured around three uh, sections of achievements, lessons learned, challenges, and opportunities. And I decided to, to use the same approach in, in bringing some of the thoughts with regards to MEAs and the UN system uh, so that we have some sort of synchronization and, and consistency. Um, so uh, in a very nutshell way, um, my humble uh, uh, sort of takeaway so far from the relationship with the MEAs and, and UN system is that um, over the last 50 years, there has been a growing trend of uh, engagement of the UN system in implementation of the multilateral environmental agreements. And, uh, and also on the other way around, the involvement of the MEAs in the, the uh, sort of the work and the legislative processes of international organizations. So it's been really an increasing and diverse trend of engagement for both sides. And these have been <clears throat> at different levels, at the administration and management level of MEAs, um, at the science policy level, communication and awareness raising, technical capacity building, especially at the country level, mainstreaming of the MEAs uh, in different sectors relating to economic, social, and political and humanitarian uh, organizations, and obviously in funding as well at all levels. <clears throat> and these have been at global, regional, and, and national level. So we are very proud to say that this uh, trend has been very growing, has been very uh, diverse over the years. And uh, it has also um, been in different uh, sort of sections or sectors, um, including in the environment sector itself, uh, in the primary production sector, social services, health, uh, production and service industry, finance and trade, humanitarian affairs, and peacekeeping. We can claim that a large body of uh, sectors in the UN system have been involved, have been embracing the environmental agenda and MEAs <clears throat> with the hope to um, have um, a contribution to, uh, uh, to their promotion, but also to make sure that they will not have any direct or indirect uh, impact uh, to the drivers of uh, environmental change in a negative manner, at least. So they, they have been really uh, been engaging in, 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 with, with, with that kind of uh, mindset. And as you can see uh, in this mapping table that we produced some 10 years ago, um, a large body of UN entities have been able to map themselves around or against the different targets of MEAs, in this case on biodiversity, but also um, on different indicators as well, trying to own and to relate those to their respective existing targets and indicators. So we have that body of information which is available. <clears throat> At the single agency level, also agencies have tried to start by either adopting environmental strategy for their organizations. Look at, for example, the case of uh, IFAD or uh, the case of um, um, WFP, World Food Program. They have now an environmental strategy with regards to delivery of the food, for example, as, as their ma main mandate. Or if they have not been able to establish an, an environmental strategy, they have tried to align their corporate strategies with MEA's targets and indicators as part of their response to the SDGs. And they also have tried to integrate environmental uh, safeguards <clears throat> into their accountability and reporting systems as part of, again, responding to the SDGs. And the core focus and objectives of, of all these sort of efforts by the UN system have been primarily to avoid harm to the environment, both by mitigating their impacts or adapting the, their, their work to be more environmentally friendly, or if they could also enhance conservation and sustainable use for example, through the different programs and, 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 and projects. 
They have also tried to uh, provide assistance to um, uh, countries uh, with, uh, with the huge amount of facilities and, and networks that they have had uh, at the regional or uh, the national level. Agencies have also tried to work with each other and uh, respond to the environmental agreements in a collaborative uh, manner, uh, benefiting from the concepts such as coalitions or, or nexuses. Uh, around the topics that bring several organizations together. And we have several examples of these nexus collaborations, uh, which are actually ongoing at the moment, either in the field of health, uh, food, peace uh, building, migration, energy, jobs, trades, and so on. And in those regards, uh, in the environment management group, we have issued reports that demonstrates the engagement of um, a diverse set of organizations uh, as you can see, either in the area of biodiversity or uh, sound management of chemicals or desertification, by building coalition, by working around cross-cutting issues that makes also and uh, that makes their work relevant to their own uh, constituencies as well when they work in, when they are working on the environment. Um, now let me just now get into a little bit of a, a few uh, sort of a number of challenges as well. <clears throat> And, and the way I have tried to put the challenges as is my job is to put them in a positive and a sort of a, a sort of a, a collaborative manner, because there is no magic solution to make a perfect, uh, uh, you know, agenda implemented uh, by the UN system on the environment. There are always challenges. So I have clustered these challenges in these uh, areas. First of all, that um, there is a lot of interactions between MEAs and UN agencies and also between the UN agencies or MEAs amongst themselves in terms of information and knowledge sharing to have the effective impact. So that needs to be improved. There is, as it was mentioned by Patrick, there is a lot that we need to do with regards to a systemic and coordinated support to countries through uh, for example, now invigorated UN country teams, uh, UNDAFs, and also the NBSAPs, and the other national UN national uh, tools and mechanisms. We have to and we need to basically improve system-wide monitoring, tracking, and accountability system. Without such a system, we will not be able to measure the results of our work. And without these instruments, we will not be able actually to to detect the policy failures and in order to uh, sort of bring into account the new emerging issues, either out of the new global crisis such as COVID and others. So we should have, we must have a monitoring system that helps strategic thinking. We also need to improve and consolidate indicators to inform policymaking and, and identify solutions for emerging challenges. And we also need to improve environmental expertise and resources tailored for a specific country situation. This is the call that it has often come to us from the UN resident coordinators. Now, what are the opportunities ahead of us? Uh, and what are the recommendations or suggestions that the Stockholm Plus 50 can offer in order to uh, enhance the UN system contribution to the implementation of the MEAs? And I have clustered them in, in four categories. One is global. Uh, you know, one of the key, um, slogans and, 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 and messages that we are promoting across the globe now, having heard and having seen the uh, crisis of COVID and having living through it, is that we need to enhance multilateralism. And as part of that concept, I think there's a huge amount of opportunity that we could uh, promote collaboration for coherence in science policy in the case of the MEAs and the UN system, linking more, for example, MEA COPs and legislative processes with those of the UN system and, and trying to build more of this uh, consistent and collaborative uh, you know, efforts in decision-making, which in, as a result will also promote multilateralism. We need to uh, build more coalitions uh, around building back better and nature-based solutions. And these are the two, again, new opportunities ahead of us that will allow us to uh, support MEAs. We also need to employ um, nexus and cross-cutting approaches such as, for example, one health approach. And, and because these are the common denominators that will bring more of a convergence and collaborations in, in, in the system with only environmental 
concerns, we cannot have a whole of a society approach and engagement. And we need to promote these cross-cutting approaches more and more by the lessons learned out of the COVID. And we need also to establish UN-wide strategic planning framework. This is a concept that has been always been uh, mentioned by several um, <clears throat> reports, including, for example, the Joint UN Inspection Unit reports in several uh, iterations that they have provided. And without having such a, a strategic planning net <laughs> framework, we will not be able to have um, establish a structure that will connect the horizontal and vertical system of the UN actions and <clears throat> in order to respond to the triple planetary crisis. So we need to invest in, in such a strategic planning framework. And somebody, one entity or a couple of entities have to assume responsibility and have to invest in this uh, sort of a strategic thinking. We need to promote peer-to-peer -peer learning in the UN system and also amongst the UN system, between the UN agencies and also the MEAs at the global level and also at the regional and national. This peer-to-peer -peer concept is really helpful in order to examine the successfulness of one approach in one set of countries in, in others without uh, losing a lot of money and, and, and investing um, <clears throat> our, our very limited resources. And we need also to mobilize the, the youth and the people's uh, engagement in the UN system constituencies and connect them to each other, especially to those in the MEA's constituencies. At the so we're and going to have to wrap it up in a minute because we're coming to the end of our allocated time. Yes. Um, I think that's a fantastic set of recommendations on global. Perhaps if you could just wrap it up uh, briefly going through regional and national, and then we'll have to draw the, uh, the event to a close. But, but really interesting recommendations there. You, you jumped the gun with me in terms of wanting to throw that question to you. Back to you. Thank you so much. I, this is my last slide, so I will be very quick. Um, on the regional and national, uh, I think, as I mentioned earlier on, we need to benefit from this reinvigorated UN country teams and resident coordinators. Uh, we need also to make uh, uh, national biodiversity or chemical strategies and action plans to be owned by the UN system agencies. We also need to utilize the technological development and digitalization to facilitate information exchange. And, and, and as, as I mentioned earlier on, this peer-to-peer -peer is, is a, at the heart of what uh, we have learned also in the past. And last but not least, we need also enhanced investment in mainstreaming of MEAs at the UN corporate level, making sure that the UN itself is leading by example when it comes to uh, implementation of the MEAs. And with that, I would just like to draw the attention of the audience to these two reports of the EMG environment management groups to the Stockholm International Meeting. And these provide much more detailed information and suggestions that the UN system as a whole has provided for the enhancement of the environment agenda in the next 50 years. And with that, I thank you so much, John, for this opportunity as an apologies for uh, going a little bit beyond the limit. And si simply it is because it's a vast uh, sort of a body of information coming from 50 UN entities in, in the environment management. I didn't want to lose uh, any of them uh, and, and, and benefit from this, all this uh, sort of uh, body of, of, of exports. So with that, thank you very much and, and over to you. Fabulous to say, no, I just wasn't quite sure when you were wrapping up. I just wanted to give you a two minute warning there. You did a fantastic uh, overview of the, the depth and breadth of the UN system. You've been at the heart of this for so long. And uh, you've offered some really uh, insightful recommendations there that I think that we'll all be interested to pick up on. And we'll be very interested to read that report. Now, are you going to be in Stockholm yourself, Hussein? Um, if my mission will be approved, yes, but it is not yet approved. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So that's your primary recommendation coming out of this webinar. <laughs> all right. No, fantastic. That was uh, really appreciated, Hussein. Um, We've got to six o'clock um, where we were due to finish at six. I don't want to keep people beyond the allocated time because you've all been generous to, to commit yourself. But what I would like uh, just to invite everyone to flick their cameras on um, because I'd like to, to thank everyone for joining us. And also uh, having now heard from everyone, see if anybody wants to add any final remarks before I hand over to Charles to hand off. And I'm going to go in the order, just any 30 second to 60 second feedback, I'll go in the order that uh, you presented. Um, Amy, any final reflections having heard what you have today? We have a lot of work to do, but it's in good hands with uh, you and all the colleagues here and the 
uh, people listening in and participating. So thanks for this and looking forward to continuing the discussion in Stockholm. Yeah, and thanks to you, Amy, for everything you're doing there as well. Um, to you, Martha. Well, the time is very short, so very much looking forward to, to Stockholm and I'll be there. And uh, thank you for this opportunity to hear and to enrich, you know, like our thinking in terms of how to move forward our environmental agenda. So thank you. Fantastic. Look forward to seeing you in Stockholm. Um, Carolina, are you still with us? Uh, we caught her out. <laughs> okay, we'll come back to Carolina if she's there. Daniel, any final reflections? Um, well, thanks, John, for, for the opportunity to be part of this. I think reflecting on the, the presentations, um, I, was, I was very positively surprised by hearing a lot about work on the national level and about the need to um, sort of tap into synergies and, and break down um, silos. So great, great conversations. Very interesting. Thank you so much. Thanks, Daniel. Patrick. Nothing from my side, but looking forward to seeing you all in Stockholm. Thank you. Likewise. And uh, Hussein, before I turn over to Charles to wrap us all up. No, thank you so much, uh, John. And uh, look forward to really uh, just to add that the, the, the heads of UN agencies will convene a roundtable uh, during the Stockholm Plus 50. And we hope to have a, a good uh, environment that uh, would allow them to actually provide some of their insight in terms of what they can commit more in the next 50 years to support implementation of the NEAs. And we very much look forward to that event uh, uh, in, in Stockholm. And uh, if, if I happen to be there, happy to also interact with all of the actors and, and receive your insights and your guidances as how we can better support the implementation of the NEAs in the next 50 years. And thank you so much and the stakeholder forum. And actually, there will be a presentation by the stakeholder for, uh, forum uh, as a sort of an opening, setting the scene. In, in our roundtable discussion. So it would be good because that you're bringing this governance dimension also uh, to, to the discussion. So we look forward to that as well. Thanks, Hussein. I'll just do one last check to see if Caroline has been able to rejoin us. If not, just let me um, thank all of our, our speakers for today. I think we've had an extraordinarily uh, inspiring and uplifting uh, conversation today. It's great to hear from Maria, looking at it from a more academic perspective. Amy, Marta, looking at it from an MEA perspective and all the work they're doing, uh, a state party perspective through Carolina, then looking at civil society and the CITES example with Marine Patrick, I think opening our eyes to the opportunities that perhaps MEAs are missing out on at a country level and accessing these pooled funds. And Hussein, great to hear uh, you wrapping it up there about how the UN system is mobilizing. I think we can feel that we've made extraordinary progress over 50 years since Stockholm. As you just said, Amy, there's a hell of a lot of work to do, but I think we can uh, look ahead to the future with uh, some level of optimism, at least that we've got a lot of good players, in particular those that have been on this call who are trying to push the agenda forward and deliver what we all want um, uh, in terms of a sustainable planet. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to you, Charles. I think I don't need to wrap up the recommendations because... I think that uh, everybody's been very clear in expressing their recommendations. I know young Gustav is online, I'm sure he captured it. And Charles, I'll hand over to you for final remarks and a big thank you from all of us to um, Stakeholder Forum for convening us today. John, uh, thank you so very much. And you know, many thanks to our audience for joining us today, to the Civil Society Unit at the United Nations Environment Program and the government of Sweden for their cooperation and support. And a huge thanks to John and our expert panel for delivering today's rich and unique content. It really was quite special. As mentioned earlier, this webinar has been recorded and that recording, the PowerPoint presentations and the chat content will be sent to you by way of an automated email from the Zoom platform tomorrow. That will include a link to the Towards Stockholm Plus 50 events page where you can find of this recording and the recordings of previous webinars. And also do please keep an eye out for our soon to be announced webinar. You'll see that on your screen on science and environment. We are, we're hoping to get that uh, finalized uh, this week and we'll share that information with you. Please also uh, for all stakeholders, join us for the People's Environment Narrative online stakeholder consultation on the 18th of May. Registration is now open and the link can be found on the Towards Stockholm 50 web website events page. Finally, a short survey will pop up as the webinar ends. 
please take a moment to complete that survey. Uh, thank you all again, uh, and please be well. Thanks, Charles. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Bye, you all. And colleagues, appreciate that. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Hey, hey, Carolina. Cheers.